Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. Tonight's webinar is for siblings and about siblings, but also for other family members. So if you have family or friends that have joined us this evening, welcome. If you want to ask questions about dealing with extended family or friends or questions that you might think that they might ask and, and how I might answer it, be happy to do that. If any of you are family and friends, welcome again to that tonight. So we've submitted some frequently asked questions, some questions that have been commonly asked by, by siblings and by others tonight. So we're going to start off with those, but please, as soon as you want to, please enter any of your questions about wilderness therapy, about what we do, about what goes on out in the field. I'll be happy to get to those after I answer all the pre-submitted frequently asked questions. And these are, these are real questions from real people. A sister by the age of, uh, of the age of 23 asked the question, I see my parents doing a lot of work and investing a lot of time and money in my brother's stay there. What happens if he comes home and nothing changes? I think for that's a legitimate f fear that people have um, because they have a history, they have trauma, they have um, something to go by, something in, in their past that reminds them that there's been progress, there's been attempts before, and we've seen things go back to the old way. So the way I answer this question, and I answer it to everybody, I answer it to this way to the clients, the students out in the field. Your job is to focus on your change. And so let, for, for the sake of an exercise, let's assume that nobody else in your family is going to change. Nobody else in your family is going to improve their communication, their aware, awareness on relate, around relationships and their issues. And so what are you going to do with that? Because I think if we focus on and expect, are expecting other people to change, I think we're likely to look for it. I think we're likely to be triggered by it what, what, if we see old behaviors. And we, we take the focus off what we can control. So the simplest answer is focus on what you can do. And what happens is, I'll, I'll answer the question now, what happens is you see things differently, you hear things differently. You're less reactive, you're less triggered, even if the old behavior returns. You can't get through this program without, without it making an impact on you and your life. And sometimes that impact is delayed. Sometimes it goes dormant for a while and there's regression. That's just a part of any treatment process. But if the whole family system changes, if other people in the family improve their awareness and their communication, then you, you have a different relationship with the problem. And, and it doesn't cause you as much angst and anxiety. And so, and, and that has a wonderful impact, a positive impact on the identified patient, on the person that was in the program too. So first and foremost, ideally just focus on what you can do, focus on your own regression. And then secondly, um, recognize that when you when you do that you, you see everything differently you feel differently about it family members that, that that really talk about this program the most positive way for years afterwards they have varying levels of success in terms of their child's change and improvement but they they, they allowed it to seep into them they allowed it to change them and that change has ripple effects in their life in every area in their life in every relationship so it's, it's a valid question, I get it, and part of it is a, is a change of focus that, that helps you to be most effective. What are your recommendations for after Evoke? My wife is pushing for her to come home right after so that she will not miss the start of the senior year. The, the simple answer for that is I, I defer to the therapist, but it, it's been our experience that, that the clients that, that get to this point often don't do best to go back to the old set, setting. There are exceptions to that, of course, but that's our that's our the the majority of the clients that we see. That's our experience with them. And so I've talked about this in webinars before, and it's something that I've been talking about for 20 years now. This there, there really ideally needs to be a shift in, in what's a priority because in many ways the timelines and the traditional mainstream way that we go about doing things it really is arbitrary and contrived, right? Other cultures, other, other periods of time have seen things differently. I'm gonna be talking about emerging adulthood next week and this concept of failure to thrive. And in other cultures, the, the timelines are different. I can use the simplest and most accessible example for myself. I struggled in high school, eventually dropped out of high school, um, went back and got a degree later, started college when I was 21, and then I got straight A's my entire college career. 
my undergrad and master's degree, and my PhD. I got a couple of lower than A's. But I, I had an academic scholarship. I graduated early, graduated with my bachelor's early. Because when you get your, your, your mind straight, when you get the first and most important thing right, then everything else falls back into place. And yes, I started college at 21. And I graduated later than my peers. But in the long run, it didn't make any difference. And, and that work and what I needed to figure out and how I, how I needed to come out of it created an important foundation. It's similar to the, the movie, <clears throat> I often refer people to watch um, uh, the, the movie with Matt Damon right now, <laughs> Good Will Hunting, one of my favorite movies, where, where you've got to change your priority and perspective. So we don't tend to value mainstream traditional timelines. We don't even think it's helpful for for, for a lot of people that are in it, let alone people that are struggling. Another thing is some of the therapeutic schools, the alternative options, I'm not talking about an alternative home school, but some of the alternatives that are provided after a vote, that are recommended after a vote, students and clients are more successful and happy in, in many cases. So while we are drawn toward what is comfortable, what is typical for us, it doesn't always lead to the best outcomes. The, the simplest example is when I walk through the halls of a therapeutic program, therapeutic school or program, the clients who, who leave Evoke, students who leave Evoke end up at. I get people standing up, walking over to me, greeting me, looking me in the eye, shaking my hand, introducing my, themselves, asking me my name, why I'm there. When I walk through the local public school, we have, a, we have a very average school system here. I see people that look depressed, alienated, alone. I look at their, their eye contact, where, where their gaze is. I look at the clicks in the small groups. The, the average high school is not an ideal situation. If we were trying to design in the beginning, what would be the, the, the ideal? It wouldn't be most of the high school setups that we have today. People at, at the most vulnerable point in, in human development, we put people in, in large schools, relatively unaccountable, limited contact with, with adults, because they have large school sizes, that's not ideal. So I'm, I'm saying it a lot. I'm saying the thing over and over again. But I would defer to the therapist, and I, I would do my best to let go of traditional mainstream timelines and, and, and expectations and, and put clinical first. With our son away at treatment, his brother at home is not interested in talking about him or get updates on how he is doing. Any advice on how, how to support him or get him to open up? First and foremost, I would say, understand what he's trying to say to you. This is a very common question, very common dynamic. You have a 13-year-old brother at home who, who likely has been hurt, who's had to watch a dynamic that's been unpleasant or, or maybe even scary, um, you know, mildly traumatic. And, and, and then their, their sibling, their brother, gets sent away, and there's peace in the home. And he's trying to set a boundary because the common thread in all trauma is that it was something outside of your control. So he's trying to take back some of this control. So I would honor it, listen to it. I would try to give it a name. I would respect it. And that's the best thing you can do to get him to open up to it, to the process. You can, of course, invite him into family therapy, and the therapist can hopefully provide a safe context. And the younger brother might be uncomfortable and feel vulnerable. And, and if I were the family therapist and you brought him in, I would do all those things that I just listed off. I would honor what he was presenting with. I would honor the feeling behind it, what he was trying to accomplish. And that would be the, the best thing I would know how to get him to open up. I think a lot of times we just push against it, right? We try to swim upstream. We try to take the energy that's being given to us and turn it around 180 degrees. And, and typically, people dig their heels in and solidify their barriers, their walls, their defenses, and we make little progress. So honoring it, respecting it, naming it, understanding it are the best ways to help it, to, to help him to move, to move off of it, to open up. I'm not sure that I trust my son is going to make the lasting changes he needs to. I've seen him relapse before, and I'm not sure I, I know how to trust he's doing as well as he says he is. Absolutely. Good. good. It's, you're, you're, you're wise to be skeptical. Be skeptical. It's okay. 
and you can tell him that you're skeptical. And if he's truly accountable, he'll actually be okay with you being skeptical. If he's not accountable, he'll have a problem with it. He'll talk about how you don't trust him and how hurtful that is, right? He'll come at you with it and try to get you to trust. But, it, you know, the wonderful thing about this process is it's not important what they say they're going to do. It's important what they're doing. And this is a very supported, well-contained context therapeutically. And so this is going to be the ideal in a lot of cases, not all cases, but most cases for your children. That They'll thrive here and they'll be challenged in less, less supportive environments. So be skeptical. You don't beat them over the head with it and get repetitive, but take a step back and, and, and take a we'll see. And, and just like I said to the 23-year-old sister a few slides ago, focus on what you can change. I love it when parents say, they'll, they'll give me a, a, drop me an email or a message and they'll tell me a brief little story about, or a parent meeting that they attend. They'll tell me a brief little story about some old behavior that cropped up in their child. But that's not the focus. What they say is, I dealt with it different. And that's the treasure. That's the most important part of the process. So just like I said to the 23-year-old sister, for the sake of an exercise, assume that he's going to relax. Assume that he's going to go get back into old pattern. And then what that requires of you or asks of you is to focus on your work, to focus on your response to it, to focus on your change. And you can have the con confidence that he went through something profound and that there's some foundation there that wasn't there before. You can have the confidence to, to hold him accountable for his behavior, knowing that he's had a great deal of instruction and enlightenment and awareness. You don't have to get into those old battles of justifying yourself as a parent or, or having to be right. You just get to have clear boundaries. So do your work, focus on your work for the sake of the exercise, assume that he's going to relapse. If not full blown, in some degree he's going to. And then focus on your response, your triggers, your new skills, your new tools. How can I be there for my brother when he has done an evoke if he's going straight to aftercare? That's a great question. You can um, you can learn what he's learning. Read some of the books that he's reading. Write some letters to him. Um, educate yourself in some ways about the process that he's going through. Ideally, volunteer to come to family therapy. Get on the phone if you're allowed to. Things like that. So what you're doing is you're entering his world. And that, that's a great way to support him. Yes, the, the physical distance is significant. But you can become involved in his world in these ways by educating. If you're watching this webinar either live or recorded, then you're doing just that. You're becoming involved. Tell him if you're allowed to write him at this point. Tell him that you watched the webinar. Watch one or two of the webinars that your parents recommend. Expose yourself, educate yourself to the process, to the language, to the tools that he's being exposed to, and you can be there for him and share with him your own learning in, in that area, what, what you're begin, becoming aware of with yourself, and then volunteer for therapy. Read some of the books that he's reading. That would be a fantastic bit of support. I feel like this is a phrase that my, my granddaughter will grow out of and doesn't need to be sent to wilderness therapy. How are you able to help her more than at home with her family who loves her? That's a great, great question. Um, let, let, me, let me start off with this. There's no doubt that her family loves her more than we do. You can't compete. You're not trying to compete, but you can't compare. That doesn't always mean that, that, that things are, are the most ideal. Even Bowen, uh, um, one of the founders of attachment theory, right? He talked about the idea that sometimes children can thrive outside of the home during adolescence at a boarding school. Sometimes our love blinds us. I always say this, you, you love your children, your family the most. It doesn't mean that you know them the best and can give them the best of what they need. So that's just a principle, okay? That's just a principle that sometimes the distance can be valuable. And I don't know your, your granddaughter specifically. I don't know, don't know her, her issues. 
but it's really like acceleration. I mean, most of the kids will say this, not all of them, but most of the kids will say this. Young adults and adolescent kids will say this. They'll say, everybody should have to come here. And the ones that are healthiest will say it even more. Like everybody would benefit from this. You're being, you're unplugged. You're getting healthy sleep, diet, exercise. You're learning how to communicate. You're learning who you are. You're learning where your vulnerability is and where your issues are. You're learning your relationship with drugs, with sex, with each other, with peer, excuse me, with peers, with self-esteem. You're doing it at evoke in a compassionate setting. You're learning about mindfulness and meditation to deal with stress and anxiety. I mean, just that description, uh, most teenagers would benefit from it. The healthiest get the most out of it. So it, it, it's a missing, it, it's, a, it's a gift to anybody. I, I, get, I, I hear this so often, I, I can't even tell you, that people will tell me. They'll write to me or email me or when I meet them in, in parent meetings when I'm visiting, they'll say, my child still talks about wilderness. I just was talking to a parent today whose child was with us many, many months ago. And he doesn't always love it. And sometimes he said he hated it, but he says, when he refers back to the, the richest part of his process, he talks about it being in wilderness. I get, I have dozens of college essays that students have, have written about this. I just, th there's an there's a article in the Boston Globe today talking about Evoke, Evoke where I was quoted as about another family suing their insurance company over not covering. And a young lady talked about it. There was a young client in there and she was talking about it saving her life and being the best thing. So it, it would be beneficial even for the average teenager, let alone those that are struggling. So even if they are going through a stage, it still provides them with tools, awarenesses, um, experiences that, that, that enrich their life. And it'll, it'll, it'll make them stronger and more aware. This, I think the students that come out of a vote the, the average student that comes out of a vote is, is richer, more, more wise, has more going for them than many of the students that didn't get sent here because they didn't need it. I told the story, I might talk about it in my book, where I brought my daughter uh, out to the field uh, during a daddy-daughter day. Daughter day. She, she had to go to work with her father one day. I took her out to her girls group. And she said to me on the way back to the car, she said, I can't believe how open they were with, with what was going on for them. And, you know, there were girls in the group who'd been sexually abused, they were in conflict, suicidal, all kinds of issues. And she said, she said that she respected them and looked up to them. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I don't want to switch places with my daughter and them. I don't want them. But how do I give her that experience and wisdom? that only a program like Evoke can do for you. So it's a long answer to a great question. My brother, 14 years old, is currently out of Evoke, and his therapist said I could come visit when my parents do. I was wondering what kinds of things I will do with my brother when I'm there. Is there a sample schedule? Not typically. I'll give you a, a basic outline. You'll have some time with the group where you will be asked to introduce yourself. You'll have some time with, with your family, maybe alone just with your brother, but if not alone with your brother, with your parents and your brother, where you'll be cooking and walking and just spending some time together talking. There will be a therapy session, which I assume you'll be invited to, that the therapist will, will run. And then the group will set up some kind of ceremony to either welcome you or say goodbye to you. So what you'll be asked to do is to talk. And it's, it's not easy. I think one thing that you might experience that you can even share with your brother is you can offer him the respect that you'll, that you'll feel for him, inevitably, I assume, for how courageous it is for him to be there and be doing the things that he's doing. He's going to look confident. He's going to be comfortable. He's going to know more than all of you about our language and the jargon and how to cook and clean and do all the stuff that we do out there. So he'll be able to take care of you. And, and then I would just be honest and ask questions. And if you're nervous and uncomfortable, I would share that with him, with the therapist, with the group. That's the, the biggest way you can honor his experience instead of coming in and, and having to get everything right, having to be perfect, having to not make a mistake. I, I always say this, 
it's such a gift when a family member that's not the identified patient, not the one that got sent to a vote, I think it's the greatest gift when they can show up with their own vulnerabilities, with their own work, with their own challenges. Because the identified patient, the person who ends up in a vote, it gets tiring being the only one in the family or the main one in the family who messes up, doesn't get things, makes mistakes, is challenged. So if you can show up with that vulnerability, it's a fantastic gift for your brother. That openness, that even that, that discomfort. What kind of follow-up do you do after my son has left to vote? Well, the, the, the transition is to the next treatment setting. So if that's home with a therapist or a therapeutic school or program, that's the transition. You have these webinars and podcasts for life, of course. That's one thing that we do. Um, we, we do parent support groups all around the country. So if you follow us on social media, you can find out about parent support groups. We do them in our, in, in typically often in our main areas, and then we do them sporadically in other areas. Um, and then, and then we'll, we'll, you're, if you're part of the follow-up study, they'll ask you questions and see how he's doing. And then if something comes up, they'll pass that on to your therapist so they might reach out to you. But, but substantially or substantively, it is a transition from a vote to the next treatment professionals. Right? The, the, the therapists and the program can't continue to provide a large service. There is an opportunity. In fact, we're just rolling it out next week of uh, parent coaching. The therapists at Evoke who volunteer for it will be willing to do on an hourly basis with, with clients. So that's an option. Talk to your consultant. We don't want that to take the place of other programming or home therapists. But it can be something that happens during the process. What is the best way for me to communicate the hurt that my brother's actions have caused me and everyone else in my family? I think a letter. And, and I would, this is my opinion. Even if you read the letter to him, write the letter and send it to your evoke therapist and get some feedback on it. If it's shaming or attacking, they'll give you that feedback. Be open to it. But if it's vulnerable, honest, real, authentic, then they'll tell you. So, that would be what, what I would encourage you to do is do it in the letter. I, you know, when I started in wellness therapy 22 years ago, we, we apologized almost for the letter writing. I, I did when I first started. It was an inconvenience. But it didn't take me long to, to realize that letter, round, letter writing is a, an incredibly powerful way to do family therapy or have family discussions. You can be intentional. You can be slow. You can learn and be coached. Right about communication skills. You're, you're not in if, if if the letter is sent. You're not in each other's you know presence to be react. Even if you have a reaction, you're triggered. It, it, it's 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 slow. There's time. It takes time to write a letter back and to send it. And, I, and that's an advantage. So I, I would strongly encourage you to write a letter and send it to your evoke therapist and see what they say. Ask for feedback about it. And then put your heart into it. Great letter. Great question. How much of therapy education is based around family living? Our brother enrolled in the program has voluntarily withdrawn from all family life. I would love to see efforts made to help him understand how we miss him being a part of the family life, reemphasizing to him the value of family. Absolutely. That, that, that's a core focus in the program. It is, first of all, finding out why he pulled away from the family. You know, that that's... In therapy, it's what I talk about in my book, find the wound beneath the symptom. The symptom, the issue, in this case, pulling away from the family, is, is just, it's just a sign. It's just the voice of, a, of an unspoken wound. So if we can find what the wound is, we can help to heal it. But if we merely look at symptom reduction, it's like cutting a weed off at, at, the, at the surface. The roots are still there, and it'll just crop up somewhere else. So that's the first thing I would say about this, but absolutely it is. And then we, we, we do that. The doorway that we walk through to get to there is we find out what's going on, why they were, why they were expressing that. All right, there's some live questions that have come up. How do you deal with your child wanting to go back to school after a vote, to her school after a vote? But as a parent... You feel her falling back in old ways and create the issues that brought her to Evoke? Or do you just insist on her not going back to the old school? Or does Evoke help her understand 
uh, it is best for her to move to another school. Depends upon her, her age. If she's under 18, you, you do what you do as a parent. A, a huge piece of the psychology of this question is, it's a great question, is you let go of trying to convince them. The best way to help a child move to acceptance of an idea, a principle, a boundary, is not to try to talk them into it, to, to lecture them into it, to teach them into it. And just to hear them, empathize, understand, and then set clear your, clearly your boundary. But the most controlling thing that we do as parents commonly is we try to talk our children into a certain feeling or thinking. That's why clients and students will say after evoke many times, they'll say, I, I never felt more free than I did at evoke, which is, seems strange, right? Because we have more boundaries, more structure, more accountability here than any home. But what they're talking about is this emotional freedom. Read the, if you haven't bought the book, buy the book. The chapter on, on the myth of being right, it, is, it talks about this. She gets to feel and think what she wants. You get to set whatever boundary you want. If she's over 18, you get to decide what to support and not support. But you let go of trying to convince them. In the, in the chapter on control versus influence, that's actually probably a better chapter for this question. I talk about the idea that most permissive parents are controlling. Because most parents use some kind of coercion debating, arguing, preaching, guilting, shaming, intimidating, badgering, right? They, they use all of those techniques. I do that too when I'm, when I'm not doing well. They do those things so they don't have to set a boundary and deal with their child being upset, manipulating them, threatening them, self-sabotaging, on and on and on. It ends up being the child is controlling you. So that's what I would say. What should the content of our letter be? Do we answer questions she has in her letter? This is parents. Great question. There's a there's kind of a few things. I have a, I have a webinar. I believe Andrea, maybe you can look it up and make sure that it's there. If not, let's put it in the queue on on writing letters. So you write in response to what she's. Let me give you about four or five things. I don't know how many there are, but I know what they are. You write in response to what she's writing. So what, what your feelings, thoughts, reactions are. You talk about what's going on in your life, the work that you're doing, some big event in your life, whatever's going on for you. you. You share about you. You write about what the therapist is talking about each week. All right? This is what I'm hearing from the therapist. This is what I'm learning from the therapist. This is what the therapist is saying about you. And those are the, the three kind of things. In response to her or, her, or him, What's going on in your life, what you're learning, what, how you're growing, events in your life. And then third, you're talking about what the therapist is talking to you about. And that includes things like how she's doing, what's going on, your new awareness about her, but also what you're learning about your role as a parent in the process. And I, I say in, in the webinar that I did, I talk about writing a bad letter. Don't try to write a good letter. Parents that get too caught up in trying to write a good letter your child knows that you need to write a good letter. So you just write an honest letter. And you let go of whether or not you love it or hate it. If you need feedback on it, ask for feedback from your therapist. But, but it's, in, it's critical. It's an important point to not judge on the surface the value, the quality of your letter by how your child responds to it. When I have parents say, oh, I, I wrote a horrible letter this week. And I say, why? And they say, well, because my child was upset. And I say, I read your letter. I, I liked it. It was OK. They're just upset. So you see, you learn, you start to learn in this work, you start to learn that when they're upset, you see them. You don't see you in that. You hear them. It's called differentiation, boundaries, awareness. Connection actually is what it's called. That's really what this program creates is a better connection. And that connection comes because the first ingredient in healthy connection is two whole people, not two half people, not people that are overlapped, reactive, triggered, dependent, but two people who, who have greater awareness. And nobody come, becomes completely whole, but we work toward that ideal. And then we have the capacity to be clo closer to each other. Do we let her know her therapist is talking with us? Absolutely. 
They all know that anyway. So yes, you, you, I, I would always tell my clients, make the point, you know, bring up the story that I told you about what happened this week. Make that point, absolutely. We want her to know that, that this, this, this system, the, the, the executive system is what they call it in family therapy. The executive system, which, which temporarily includes the therapist that evoke, is all on the same page. We're all communicating well, absolutely. Any other live questions, Andrea, before I go with announcements? Next question, how am I supposed to act toward my brother when he gets home if our relationship when he left was so bad? That's a really tough question. I, I think what I would encourage you to do is start talking about it now with him through letters. If you wait for him to get home, it's not, folks, it's not gonna, for any of you, it's not gonna get easier when they get home. I have clients that say, well, I'll talk about that when I get home. I'll deal with that when I see my parents face to face. It almost never is easier to do that. So start now, start while there's support, start while there's therapy, start educating yourself a little bit about some of the work that he's done so you have some shared language, but don't wait until he gets home. Get in there as soon as possible. It's not easy. You know, even though your brother deserves to be here, right? He earned his spot here. It's still hard, difficult, courageous work. They're being asked to do difficult things. And what I'm talking about is not the hiking and the camping. They adjust to that fairly quickly. I'm, at, I'm talking about talking about their feelings, opening up, being vulnerable, dealing with pain, learning to communicate assertively, learning to listen. You know, I, I would encourage probably to start with the, the webinar on listening. And then you have some shared language and then you can begin to talk about it. But I would start the sooner the, the, sooner the better. How much therapy does she get? Can she stay in contact with the girls in the program when she is released? What is your success rate with kids getting better? Uh, I'll answer all those questions. Uh, therapy is all day long every day. So it's constant. It's an experiential therapy program. She gets a session each week with a therapist. She gets a, two groups with a therapist, but they have several groups every day with the staff. They have one-on-ones with the staff all week long. On an average day, they'll have between five and 10, what we call standing groups, where they'll work on problem solving or communication or feeling because one of the students wants to talk about it, one of the clients wants to talk about it. So it happens constantly all throughout the week. Um, can she, you know, we, we, if they're adolescents, we ask them not to exchange information. Um, it can be problematic. We want the parents to be the gatekeeper of that if they're adolescents. If they're young adults, they can, of course, call each other if they want to. If those are good connections, then they're positive. If they're negative connections, then, you know, we want them to be prepared for that, and to deal with that and be mindful and, and, and um, intentional about that. What is your success rate? We have the most extensive research in the field of wellness therapy. So just go to our website, click on About Evoke, and click on uh, Research. And then there's a couple of different, there's our research and then there's additional research and you can read it there. Overwhelmingly, it's the most powerful and effective form of treatment I've ever seen. And the research bears that out. We have great studies with, with fantastic um, retention in our long-term outcome studies. But we also, there's also references there to um, other studies of wilderness therapy also. But Evokes is, is really the gold standard in doing research in the field of wilderness therapy. How many letters can I write to my sister? Can I send her anything? Um, typically not send her anything. You can ask your, your, your parents to ask the evoke therapist, but typically we don't have you send them anything. Um, and really it's, the, it's up to the therapist. It's every individual therapist that decides when a sibling writes. We don't want them to lose focus and a lot of the issues are central to mom and dad and the child, but having a sibling involved even early on can be very, very beneficial because they can be more open, more willing to listen, more sensitive to a sibling. So it's directed by the therapist. 
So ask your parents, ask the therapist if it's if it's the right time to write. Um, and usually we just have people write once a week. Most siblings don't write weekly. Um, and, and sometimes I wouldn't want them to write every week because, again, the core issues, the main issues are going to be communicated in and about the parents' letter. And I want that energy focused for, for some time. But, but almost always, almost always that I have siblings write some letters. And, and they go through the therapist, too. Once our daughter comes back home from Evoke and doesn't have the support of Evoke that she's had, how do we keep her from falling again, from not falling again? Well, hopefully you have an after aftercare plan. Go to Al-Anon. You know, I'm, I'm going to go to this slide because we ask all parents to do this. Um, you know, these, these are all free resources. Alanon.org, Coda.org, Families Anonymous, Naranon, Alateen is for teenagers, and then NAMI.org is uh, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. You can go there to get classes, education, ongoing support. So in addition to having a therapist at home, to having a family therapist, to whatever aftercare plan you're working on, in addition to all of that, we ask all parents to go to six of these. And, and these are not just for the parents of kids involved with drugs. Families Anonymous and CODA has nothing to do with somebody necessarily being involved with drugs. A lot of people that go there are, do have that issue, but it's for, for people who have loved ones who are participating in self-destructive, self-sabotaging, self-harming behaviors, whether that be drugs or other, other mental health issues, other symptoms. So start now. Get recommendations from your therapist about what should be in place next. And then there's going to be some there's going to be some fall there's going to be some regression there's going to be some mistakes that's that's a part of it so part of the the the, the change in in sensibility that, that ideally happens for parents is they learn how to deal with it more effectively more powerfully and, and it it hurts you less and it scares you less and it angers you less because you've changed I always talk about getting new ears and new eyes listen if you're new to the program listen to the podcast, watch the webinars, learn the language. Most of what I say is what any therapist who's been doing this for any length of time would say. In fact, if I could echo the voice of, of so many of my colleagues, it would be get the parents to, to work on themselves, get them to do their work, not from a blame or a shame perspective, but it helps the child to maintain the gains because you're different. If you haven't read my book yet, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, I know it sounds trite, but buy it and start reading it. It teaches you to think about the issues in a different way than you've been thinking about them. So those are some, some answers to those questions. Our daughter wrote that she's sorry for what she put us, uh, put us parents through, but for some Think she is not sorry. Do we ask her to explain what she's not far, sorry for? Sure. You know, I wouldn't. I didn't. I didn't pay a lot of attention to apologies. I, if it was an evidence of somebody recognizing empathically that they had hurt people, that's great. But I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a, after doing it for a while, I'm a little skeptical of the value of apologies and promises. I, I just kind of watch what they're doing now. And being sorry, that, that's not what it's about. It's, it's being aware. It's knowing what was going on, being, a, being accountable, being responsible, understanding what you did. This is not about getting in trouble or being bad or being wrong. This is about mental health and addiction. It's not about being good. It's about being more whole or healing in the process. So, when we think in terms of the paradigm of good and bad, right and wrong, and then we kind of encourage that, then we get lots of apology. When we think about it in terms of mental health or addiction, we get some apology, but mostly we get awareness. Mostly we get accountability. And the emphasis is not on the apology or the promise. I would, I would not put a lot of stock. I would not get really excited about apologies or promises. I would just listen, be curious. And then, yeah, ask her what she's not sorry for. I think that's a really, really great question. Maybe there's some things that she still feels 
hurt and angry about and, and give her give her a place give her a safe line of communication for that what do you do when an older sibling is is a primary root of the wound what do you do when a sibling older sibling is the primary root of the wound and does not want to address his responsibility I mean ideally family therapy I, it depends upon how old they are but you know if, if they're abusive to their sibling uh, I, would, I would bring them into family therapy at least I, I would treat them the same way that, that, that I that I would treat the child that got sent to a vote which is you've got some issues and we're not okay with these and here's our rules or our boundary or here's what we're going to do as a family to address those but get them in the therapy with you family therapy good question why is our sister why is why is our sister diet so little i don't understand the question why is our sister diet so little try asking it again and i'll try to answer I'm sorry. I might just be slow tonight. Thanks for joining us. It's been a really good turnout. Lots of good questions. Why did you create the program? Did you go too? No, I didn't go. I got sent to treatment when I was 16, turned 17, but I was at a hospital in Huntington Beach, California. Um, I did it because I've never seen something so effective. I did it to provide a, a safe place for kids and a, a place for families to heal. And I wanted this, I wanted to, we wanted to change wilderness therapy to be a family program. When I started, it was not a family program. There was hardly any family work out there. I wanted it to be more compassionate. We wanted it to be whole health, meaning mind, body, and spirit. We wanted healthy food, healthy sleep. I, I've just never seen something so effective so powerful, so dynamic in helping young people grow. Um, it's, it's just it's just a joy. And then to, to get to have the contribution in wilderness therapy that we've had, when we, when we created our own program in, in 1998, we changed wilderness therapy nationwide. And, and still, I believe we do the best work and have the most family support services. But we absolutely created that part of, of wilderness therapy and I'm, I'm grateful for that and, and, and I'm proud of that work that we accomplished to, to change that but in a way I, I i get to go every week and i learn as much as my clients learn as my students as, and my families learn this is a gift to be able to do this work i did send my son when he was 13 to the program he went there graduated he's been sober for about seven years now. He also worked for me, uh, graduated from college, doing really well in his life. We saw her list of food and it seemed so scarce uh, to what she was eating. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So why is her diet at Evoke? They get all that they need for sure. Um, they get more than enough calories per day. Um, and we have a nutritionist who creates the, the, the diet and makes sure that it, it has all that they need. And they can get more of the basics anytime that they run out. If they're hungry, they get fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Um, no processed sugar, low sugar. Um, they get healthy grains. They get meat a couple of times a week, fresh meat a couple of times a week. They have packages of meat like tuna fish, uh, packaged salmon, or other things throughout the week. So it's a pretty healthy diet, actually, with plenty of calories. Some people end up loving it. It's, but it's weird. It doesn't taste as good at home. When I bring the field food at home, it's not as good, but it tastes so good out there. And they learn to cook. We teach them how to cook. They learn to use spices. They can have some treats now and again if they earn them, some extra treats. What is the average mood of the participants there? Is there anyone sad and upset if they have to do this from a sister? Great question. Some of them are sad. Some of them are angry. As they move along in the program typically usually they let go and they move through those feelings they accept being here many of them the, the second half of their program they, they value it they, they see how important it is and see how it's helping them 
some of them even like me, like it a lot by the time they leave, most of our graduates will tell us that they want to come back and work for us. One quarter of our staff at any given time are former clients. Not all of them come back, of course, but that's how they express it to themselves. But what we learn as therapists and what we learn at Evoke is we just let people feel their feelings. That's the best way to get through it. And it's not easy here. It's not always fun and pleasant. Sometimes it's hard and uncomfortable. And there's a lot of sadness, but we just allow them. We honor their feeling. We let them feel. I used to tell my, my children when they were younger that I work with the sad boys. I always work with boys. That I work with the sad boys to teach them how to feel. And sometimes you have to go through difficult or, or uncomfortable emotions. But most of, we try to have fun every day. Try to play games every day. You know, as, as well, it depends on how the group is doing and how they're getting along. But they, they go through, they, they learn a lot of really fun games, actually, that they'll be able to share with you later on. They feel really proud of themselves in a lot of ways because um, they do hard things. They learn to make fire by rubbing sticks together and to, to camp outdoors and, and with primitive living, meaning they don't get to go inside. They don't have running water or, or, or heat except for the fires that they make. So they get really proud of what they accomplish here. What should we be doing in the interim in terms of family therapy? Any other literature we could read about in terms of healthy communication? Well, my book, of course, talks about it. There's several webinars on communication. If you go to the parent portal and you search communication, you'll see a list of all the all of the webinars. You can also listen to them on podcast. One of my favorite books on communication is called Nonviolent Communication. It's a fantastic book on communication. So there's a few resources. I think just talking to your to your therapist at home about what you're learning. Have your wellness therapist talk to them and consult with them. Share your letters that you're getting and giving with your family therapist at home. Go to the, go to the Al-Anon meetings, the Families Anonymous meetings, the six that we ask you to go to. Like I said, if you want to do deeper work, you can come and do um, the Finding You or, or a family intensive at some point. You can also do, we ask all families to go to a workshop if, if they possibly can. So those are a couple of other things that you can do. Go to the NAMI website, nami.org and look for resources, classes, online things there. So there's a lot of things you can do. The webinars, the podcast, the book are great places to start. How many kids enroll in this program? Do they go voluntarily? Um, most of the adolescents, most of the teenagers don't go voluntarily. Um, we have five or six groups in, in our Utah program and four or five groups in our in our Oregon program and in each group there's between six and nine students typically. So it depends upon the season. In summer we get fairly full. So during the month of June we have a waiting list, for example. And then right before school starts we, we shrink in size a little bit and that, that goes on every year. But each group is only six, seven, eight, nine clients or students together. So they don't see anybody else. They just spend time in only their group. Group one never sees group two, never sees group three, and so on. Then they have four staff, three or four staff, who come into the group each week and they stay and live with them for eight days until the new staff relieves them eight days later. So that's, I thought about that today. There's no other therapeutic approach in the world that has a staff member with an eight day shift. That, that, that can't be, undervalued. That's a really, really effective way to build relationships, to make sure that there's accountability and oversight and consistency and support and so on. Our daughter seems to be dishonest with her therapist. Do we tell her therapist or do we let it be? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You tell the therapist. 100%. You tell them what you're hearing and you tell them what, what is not true. That's, that's, it's essential. Great question. Are, the punishments, are there punishments if the child does not follow the rules? What do the punishments consist of if so? Um, 
Yes, there can be consequences. We don't. The problem with punishment is it can be from a place of anger, and so we don't want to do that. It's also not very helpful to teach the child what to do. So our, our boundaries, our consequences, our punishments are going to be around safety. You know, a, a timeout, which we'll call separate. It can be writing assignments, can be um, extra service for the group. But most of the time it's a discussion. Unless somebody's being unsafe, threatening somebody else, most of the time the, the punishment, quote unquote, is a discussion about what's going on. If it continues or it creates a lack of emotional and physical safety in the group, then yes, we're going to intervene at a more significant level, like giving them a timeout or separates or some kind of supervision. So, but, so we don't think about punishment a lot because it's not, it's not the most effective way to encourage or facilitate change. But if it comes to safety, we'll make sure that people are safe by giving them space and so on. Sometimes it's usually just logical and natural consequences. If they don't finish their work, they don't get to play games at night. Sometimes we'll reward them with hot chocolate at night or, or songs or an extra game. So a lot of times it's just it's just natural, like what fits for, for the exam. If they finish early, we might have extra games, extra fun, activities like that. So our daughter is under 18. I would like to know how does Evoke assess and know that our daughter is being truthful about the work she is doing at Evoke and Healing, that she has really internalized the tools Evoke has taught her to be able to overcome the daily challenges of the routine when she comes back home. And that she is not just coming up, uh, not just uh, continuing to put up a front, letting her therapist at Evoke know what they want to hear or for her to be released by Evoke. Well, I'll say it this way. It's, it, it's what we do. It's, it's constantly what we do. This is, this is the biggest question that most parents are asking. So we're tuned into that. But what happens is they eventually show up. They eventually show up meaning that they get exposed right by their peers by the time by the behavior they can't hold their breath that long and if they seem to be doing really really well for, for many weeks without any slip-ups mistakes then we start to ask the, a different question which is why are you doing so well here and you weren't at home what's different and how can we maintain this and sometimes so, so you do lots of things, but we trust peers. We trust the process. It happens. We're very skeptical. See, an evoke therapist, a therapist in general, doesn't hear things the way that a lay person does. So when somebody tells me how well they're doing something or how great they're doing or how they're fixed or cured, I, I don't hear that the way that you would hear it. I'm wondering what they're trying to sell me. Right? I'm wondering why they're trying to convince me. And so it's subtle, but that's our skill set. And when they when they don't talk about their struggles, when they don't talk about their mistakes, when they defend their mistake, when they're always trying to impress you with something or prove something or get out of here. When, when they do that, when that energy is present and you see it, when they're not open to feedback, when they're constantly trying to manage the image that you have in them on and on and on, even if they're doing it well, you, you wonder what's going on. You wonder why the sales job, what's going on. And then eventually, out of hope they get exposed. Sometimes when people are, are hyper compliant, and I got a I got a lot of hyper compliant students, I took away the journey pack. I took away their curriculum. Because they were just going through checking off boxes. And oftentimes those clients, those students, four or five weeks in, would get frustrated and exasperated with me and say, I'm working my butt off to impress you, and you're not being impressed essentially. And I'd say, Don't try to impress me. That's not what this is about. It's like going to the doctor with a knee injury and trying to hide your injury, trying to convince the doctor that you're helpful instead of talking about how it hurts and how it doesn't work, how it's not feeling. So that's what we do. And then share your skepticism with the therapist. It's very important that they hear that for sure. Are there poisonous creatures in the wilderness? Has anyone been bitten by a creature and had to be hospitalized? Um, there are no, well, there are poisonous creatures out there, but we've never had, we've never had anything more than a bee sting out there. Um, there are scorpions occasionally, there are snakes occasionally, but they, they stay away from our camps and we've never had, to, to my knowledge, never had a scorpion sting or, or 
a snake bite that I know of. I'm pretty pretty sure about that at Evoke. So none of those things. So people are more likely to be hospitalized by a sprained ankle or fall or bad, you know, if they have a bad back or something like that or a strep throat or something like that. But I, I was sitting there. I have this <clears throat> video on my phone. Uh, I know some of you aren't going to like this, but and a tarantula. There's tarantulas out in the and, and, and desert. A tarantula came walking right out from under my chair. I'm not a big spider fan. I'm not terrified of them. Um, I had a pet tarantula when I was a kid, but that was many years ago. But he just sat there and we just watched him and he just walked through our session and, and off after a little while. So you see some of those things once in a while, but they we've never had any problem with them. I, I, I showed, I took my kids out to the wilderness and showed, I've showed them snakes and tarantulas, but you have to look pretty hard. They stay away from camp. They don't like being around people. They make too much noise. How do our parents ever trust our daughter again? Her lies and deception have plagued our family for some time. It's difficult to say this, but although we miss her terribly, her other children and we, her parents, are relieved that she is at Evoke and not at home. Of course. Makes sense. Take your time. It takes time to heal. You're not on any time clock to trust her right away. And again, if this is really important, if somebody is accountable, somebody is aware and open they're going to give you time they're going to be patient they're not going to pressure you or guilt you about not trusting them and then if you're stuck talk to your revoke therapist about it if it's about you if it's about you trying to punish or you trying to protect from never getting hurt again then there might be some letting go for you to do but but don't be in a hurry and don't feel obligated to have to trust it's okay to mistrust you have a history. It would be unwise of you to trust quickly. And it takes time. It takes time to heal and to change patterns and to internalize these things. So a quick hurry trust is, is not, not the thing. I always say this, that trust comes on the terms of the person who's been hurt, not on the person who's done the hurting. So you have that right. You can own it. It's yours to own. But take your time. All right, thank you folks. Great turnout, great questions. I hope this was helpful. Um, like I said, we want all parents to go to these six, to six of these meetings while the child is with us. Not the NAMI.org, but Al-Anon, Coda, Families Anonymous, Naranon, al are for Teenagers. Please go to six. Follow us on social media. You can listen to all of these webinars on the podcast app on your iPhone. Search Evoke Therapy Programs, or if you have an Android device, Download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs. You can also find the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook. It's a, an organization of alumni uh, parents that was set up to help people who can't afford therapy. You can also, of course, listen to our blog. My book is The Journey of the Heroic Parent. You can get it on Amazon. You can also get an audio version of it. If you go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page, on Amazon through the Amazon Smiles program, you can look up books that were recommended by the therapist at Evoke, and a percentage of the proceeds goes to charity. I don't have any parent support groups announced. I'll be announcing those soon. We would like all current families to come to a workshop if they can. And you can combine that with a field visit if the timing is right, according to your therapist. If you want to do deeper work, you can come to the, the intensives that I run. The next one is in Park City, July 17th through 20th. We also have one in Toronto, August 22nd through 25th, and then back in Utah, September 17th through 20th. You can also do a private family intensive. We also have pursuits program. This is for families or young adults. Think of therapy light, adventure therapy, sober therapy, but with a, with a strong adventure component. Um, all right. The next webinar podcast broadcast will be on Sunday, June 25th at 4.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And that'll be on emerging adulthood and this idea that we have in our culture about failure to launch. So I'll be talking about young adult issues around that. Thanks for joining us. I hope this was helpful to family members, to friends, and to siblings. Everybody take care. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you Sunday. Bye-bye.